despite his recognized abilities as orator and propagandist, and despite the trust placed in him, McGee always remained something of an outsider in the Young Ireland movement. Josephine Phelan in her, Phelan in her book, The Ardent Exile, The Life and Times of Thomas Darcy McGee, she talks about McGee being dispatched to Scotland in the spring of 1848 to organize a landing of a small contingent of Scottish-based Irish to assist the rising. I mentioned that earlier on. And this is what Phelan writes. It is typical of his career with Young Ireland that at this point, McGee was the one chosen to be sent off alone. He had never shared in the common background, family connections and student friendship, friendships that held the Young Irelanders together. Having spent three years in America, he had come among them too old and experienced to fit in with the younger ones, too young to be accepted as an equal by, by the seniors. To the end, he remained the odd one. I feel this phrase, the odd one, is quite important because a case of some sort can be made that Thomas Darcy McGee was always a bit of an oddity, a loner, an outsider, a maverick. Physically, he was a rather strange looking little man, no more than five feet three inches in height, according to a police description of him in 1848. William G. Davis, in, a, in his article, Thomas Darcy McGee, Irish founder of the Canadian nation, describes him as follows. Those who saw him for the first time were not usually impressed. He was short and stubby. His face was homely and not much helped by shaggy hair and whiskers. It was redeemed from ugliness only by its remarkable expressiveness. However, in contrast, he possessed, by all accounts, a fine voice and was unusually eloquent. And perhaps this is a good time to these are two quotes taken from um, T.P. Slattery's book. Right, and as you can see, I put both in inverted commas for a specific reason. Right, uh, right. Nickname, this Slattery mentions this, and I don't know kind of what the source of it, it doesn't appear to be called this in Ireland, his nickname Darkie. And a contemporary quote from the 1860s, he looks like a wild Indian. Okay, that's the very common deliberately. Um, and as you can see, kind of very kind of interesting features. Looks very stare. Another photograph of him. And uh, again, this just shows him at his desk. I don't know how well you can make that out. Again, but for the extent that you can make the face out there, an interesting little character. But again, his, ma his major sort of uh, feature, the, the things that appealed to people was that he seemingly had a wonderful smile and was exceptionally eloquent. Uh, there's another photograph I'll show you later on from the, the monument that was unveiled within uh, nine, a few years ago. Okay. On a personal level, McGee seems to have been something of a frustrated scholar who found his time and energy being diverted into politics which, does not, which uh, do not appear to have been his first love. However, having got himself entangled in politics, he relegated his own personal life, including his marriage, to a distant secondary position. Again, I'm quoting Jacqueline Phelan here. She writes about McGee and Mary Caffrey, who was his wife. She talks about their honeymoon, the honeymoon in the summer of 1847. Since private life played a small part in, in Darcy McGee's career, one would like to think of this honeymoon as a happy interlude. One would like to think that Mary especially found all her heart desired, for she was never to hold first place in the life of a man she had married, of the man she had married. Not that Darcy would be unfaithful or prefer any other woman to her, but the truth was that she had married a patriot love of country would always be greater in this man than love of any creature. Even after he was forced into exile, he simply adopted another country upon which to extend his devotion. There's an interesting passage because it suggests the human cost of McGee's devotion or patriotism, patriotism or uh, i.e. his wife and his children paid a price for Darcy McGee's obsessions. 
he appears to have been devoted to his family, but rarely free to spend much time with them as he was traveling, trying to promote his schemes, or was lecturing, or trying to work on his newspapers. Certainly, even when McGee was involved in Canadian politics, the family's financial position was precarious. At that time, MPs were not paid a salary. McGee was only paid by the Canadian Exchequer as such when he was a cabinet minister for a very short period of time. And of course, the ones who went into politics were gentlemen who had the money. McGee was very much an exception there. Little is known about his wife, who is a native of Wicklow, except that she, single-handedly most of the time, was left to raise the two surviving daughters. Politically, McGee had that strange knack of landing himself in short-term alliances with opponents. Following on from what I've suggested about him being an outsider, by temperament if not by choice, it strikes me that by nature he was not a party political animal. Elected as an independent in uh, Montreal, largely due to the support of the Irish in the city, he was instructed by his supporters as to the causes which he should support. And of course, the major cause that the Irish were interested in that stage was a separate school system, i.e. kind of uh, control of their own schools, Catholic school system. He was warned after his election by True Witness, the Montreal Irish Catholic newspaper, whose editor, George E. Clark, was not a great supporter of McGee at any time. Clark declared, fail in this, Falter for one moment in your allegiance to the great and holy cause which we have chosen you to advocate, and you will find us as prompt to pull you down as we have been to raise you up. No excuse will be accepted, and no pardon or indulgence extended for the, light, for the slightest deviation from the paths of rectitude. Despite the giant... Despite the jarring moralistic tone adopted by this newspaper, and it's clear, by the way, that the editor, Clark, had a, had, had a grudge for McGee. He saw him as a rival, in other words. The Irish, and to a lesser extent, and the French Catholics, had clear self-interest in mind when they dispatched Darcy McGee to, to Parliament. His subsequent parliamentary career, where he flitted from being an independent to supporter of both the opposition and of, of the government in turn, has been used by his detractors in Canada and Ireland to suggest that here was someone who was so power hungry that he changed sides at the drop of a hat. While it cannot be denied that Darcy McGee made a number of leaps from one political alliance to the next, and as such left himself open to the accusation that his principles were only as deep as his pockets, one may interpret his moves and motives in a somewhat less sinister way. Apart from the fact that party politics were less clearly defined in those days than they are now, it seems to me that it was in Darcy McGee's character to remain independent, again, getting back to what I was saying about being an outsider, being a maverick, and as such, he could see a logic in tactically transferring his allegiance, albeit temporary allegiance, allegiance to one political grouping as it suited whatever goal he had in mind at the time. If that is the explanation, explanation, however, it still leaves a question mark about Thomas Darcy McGee's naivety in matters of politics, which I first raised when I spoke of his participation in the 1848 rebellion. Except for those who have damned Darcy McGee as a self-seeking traitor, and that again I stress both on the Irish side and the Canadian establishment as well when it stood at their purpose. Except for those, it has long been fashionable to see him as an idealist rather than a pragmatist. If nothing else, if one wishes to be cynical about politicians, here was one who, when he had the opportunity, failed miserably to line his own pockets, who started out in life with nothing and who died with nothing. This is how Robin B. Burns sums up this attitude in a recent article, From Freedom to Tolerance, Darcy McGee, the First Martyr. Thomas Darcy McGee has not been usually associated with skill in politics. Orator, poet, visionary, dreamer, prophet, and enthusiast have been the words generally ascribed to him, never politician. 
those who have found Canadian politics unimaginative and distasteful, it's not me saying this by the way, this is Burns, okay, <laughs> described McGee as one who shone with all the power of genius to convert the stagnant pool of politics into a stream of living water. To those who have been impressed by the finesse of a Sir John A. Macdonald, McGee was a naive idealist and poet whose emotion and imagination outran common sense and practicality. He dreamed of British-American nationality, but he could not provide for his family. He seemed to share that quality he once identified with the Irish, this habit of preferring figures of speech to figures of arithmetic. And again, it's not me saying that, I disagree with him. Robin Burns goes on to argue that McGee was not the naive politician he has been made out to be, stating that he, McGee, articulated his changing positions with a careful regard for the constituency he was attempting to lead. <coughs> the opinion in that constituency covered a wide spectrum. Irish and Catholic opinion was divided, not only on what the true interests of the community were, but also on how these were to be achieved. McGee recognized this and did his best to divine, to find his policies in such a way as to alienate as few as possible. That's Burns. Perhaps we have been conditioned too much by politicians for whom leadership means putting one's neck on the block 5% of the time and commissioning opinion polls to find out what the public wants and likes the rest of the time. Perhaps we have been conditioned too much by these people to appreciate how different Darcy McGee was and that he risked offending his own supporters by not towing the line and by doing what he believed he ought to do. We may admire his courage and vision. However, the political reality is that despite what Burns says, Darcy McGee did alienate quite a number of people, especially the Irish in Montreal. One may admire his courage, but one is left with the feeling that yes, this man was politically naive. As a leader, he had vision without doubt, but he failed to bring his own supporters along with him. One question linked in with McGee's political career is whether he was an ambitious person. Certainly, the young man we see in Boston in 1842 at the age of 17, having just emigrated from Ireland, he was brash and bold. What he lacked in educational qualifications and social connections, he made up for in sheer brass neck. One can't help but admire the way he pushed himself forward in the world and admire the way he subsequently promoted education as a means of social advancement for the Irish. In this, he, who was largely self-educated, displayed a progressive attitude, a word one wouldn't usually associate with the majority of McGee's political contemporaries. If ambition can be gauged by one's material success, one can categorically state that McGee was a definite failure. However, if one defines ambition and ambitious as one seeking to use to the full potential one's skills and attributes, then Thomas Darcy McGee was ambitious. Similarly, he wished that Irish immigrants in the United States and, Can uh, and Canada would also be ambitious. It appears that McGee became disenchanted with the United States during the second period he lived there from 1848 to 1857. So this was after he fled Ireland, after the failure of the 1848 Rising. He seems to have become disillusioned uh, by, the, by the rampant materialism he found in the United States, by the dog-eat-dog -dog attitude of its government and people as he saw it, and also by the, the large uh, and widespread anti-Catholic bias that he had come across. During those years in the States, not merely had he been involved in establishing and editing various newspapers in New York Nation, named after the Young Irelanders paper, paper and the American Celt. He had lived at various times in New York, Buffalo and Boston, but he had also pioneered various schemes to advance the position of Irish immigrants through education, and through migration from cities to the countryside. None of these schemes was successful. McGee had the chance to return to Ireland 
when the, once the British had uh, declared a general amnesty in 1855 for those who had been involved in the 1848 rising. Charles Gavin Duffy, uh, a comrade from 1848, approached McGee about returning to revive the nation in Dublin. That's the newspaper in Dublin. McGee rejected the opportunity, deciding to remain in the United States. Phelan writes about this decision. It was a sound decision, but strange for a patriot who a short time before had been writing in, uh, of Ireland in terms of passionate idolatry. McGee was in, in the position of the lover who discovers to his secret astonishment and embarrassment that although separated from the mistress he had vowed he could not live without, he not only continues to live, but to be interested in living. <laughs> this decision, of course, that's, that's feeling, this decision, of course, raises questions about McGee's attitudes to his homeland, homeland by the mid-1850s. He had visited Ireland around 1855 after the British amnesty. He met family in Wexford, and he met old comrades and old colleagues from the Young Ireland movement when he was in Dublin. Back in the United States and later in Canada, he continued to publish his books and poems about Ireland and the Irish. However, he showed absolutely no inclination to move back home, to become involved in fresh attempts at exporting or encouraging rebellion in Ireland. And in fact, he quarreled with John Mitchell in the United States in 1854, again a young Irelander, over Mitchell's attempts to encourage anti-British feeling amongst Irish Americans. The truth seems to be that by the 1850s, the mid-1850s, Darcy McGee had had enough of the reality of Irish politics. He had had enough of the reality of Ireland, and he had enough of the reality of the United, uh, United States. While still keenly interested in the welfare of Irish immigrants into North America, he was seeking a new life. And if that meant transferring himself physically and transferring his allegiance to another country, he was willing to do that. Canada, which he had frequently visited, seemed the best choice. Although he didn't move to Montreal to 1857 at the request of the Montreal Irish, as I said, it is evident that by July 1856 he was contemplating a move northwards. He wrote a letter to the Catholic Bishop of Toronto in which he stated, my Lord, disappointed in this country, that's the United States, of that religious freedom and equal justice which was the hope of so many emigrants, I, I have all but resolved to make my future home and that of my children in the valley of the Ottawa, probably in Ottawa City. I write to ask the favor of your Lordship's advice, if you will be so kind as to give it me, as to that section of the province. My hope is to bring up my children untainted and unwarped by false systems of education or miseducation. And as I cannot isolate them thoroughly in this state of society, I in the United States, I'm most anxious to take them with that view to Canada. For myself, I possess a sort of half competence, which with a connection with some Canadian publication would yield me a sufficient income. My wants, except in books, are few and easily purchased. But I will not conceal from your Lordship that being in my 32nd year and having a passion for political studies, I would faint hope to enter your Parliament and render some service in the battle which your Lordship is so heroically fighting for the souls of the children of your province, i.e. the separate school system. Apart from the physical move, there was also a clear psychological move as well. From being an Irish nationalist, Darcy McGee was rapidly transformed, miraculously transformed, one might suggest, that one must be a little bit cynical, into a zealous Canadian nationalist. Yes, he remained proud of his Irish connections and keen to protect the rights of Irish immigrants into Canada, especially to their separate school system. However, for McGee, Ireland's conflicts were in the past, and he neither wished nor intended to have anything to do with them. Moreover, his brand of Canadian nationalism led him to actively promote, or to promote actively, the creation of a new <coughs> Canadian Confederation, 
which would include all of British North America. He stated, I see in the not remote distance one great nationality bound like the shield of Achilles by the blue rim of ocean. I see it quartered into many communities, each disposing of its internal affairs, but all bound together by free institutions, free intercourse, and free commerce. I will see within the round of that shield the peaks of the western mountains and the crest of the east, eastern ocean, and he lists all the, the lakes and the, uh, and, and the, and the rivers all, all, um, along the way. By all these flowing waters and all the valleys they fertilize and all the cities they visit in their courses. I see a generation of industrious, contented, moral men, free in name and in fact, men capable of maintaining in peace and in war a constitution worthy of such a country. So this was the, uh, what he proposed, uh, the new country proposed. He went on to state, state that the new nation that he envisaged would incorporate, quote, a Canadian nationality, not French Canadian, nor British Canadian, nor Irish Canadian. Patriotism rejects the prefix. And this Canadian nation, uh, nationality, as he talks about it, is in, my, um, is, in my opinion, what we should look forward to. That is what we ought to labor for. That is what we ought to be prepared to defend to the death. So Thomas Darcy McGee, from talking about defending Irish liberty, is now talking about fighting to the death to defend Canadian. Interesting. This is right. All this sounds wonderfully idealistic and visionary and utopian, of course. However, one can understand why one, many of McGee's Irish Catholic supporters, who were still striving for equality in their new home, who had to put up with things like the Orange Order, why these people were anxious about the implications of what he was now not merely proposing, but actively promoting. McGee was calling not just for political integration, but cultural assimilation of the various ethnic groups in order to create what appears to be a largely Anglo-centric nation, loyal in its allegiance to the British monarchy. McGee believed that if the Irish were to make a success of the opportunities offered to them in Canada, they would have to shed any sense of being involved in affairs back home. Just as he had done so himself, the Irish in Canada would have to devote all their energy to their new country, and whatever about retaining their emotional ties with Ireland, forgo any active participation in deciding and directing its fate. I believe that it's now clear why McGee was so bitterly opposed to the Fenians. Not merely did he feel that they threatened the economic, social, and religious uh, gains that Irish Canadian or the Irish uh, Catholics have made in Canada, but the Fenians <coughs> represented to Thomas Darcy McGee the way in which the American Irish had not been politically integrated into the United States. He wrote, "This very Fenian organization in the United States, what does it really prove but that the Irish are still an alien population?" camped but not settled in America, with foreign hopes and aspirations unshared by the people among whom they live. If their new country was their true country, would they find time and money to spare in the construction of imaginary republics? So they have, no, they, have, they, have, they have no hope for public career in the land of the know-nothings. And the rank and file feel that while their stomachs are filled, their affections are starved in that hard and fast new society. That all this weak and wicked yearning after the impossible has developed in both classes. It is on the one part folly, on the other part crying, but it is human nature after all. In other words, he was saying that, that the reason that the Irish Americans are sending money and guns and arms over to Ireland is because they're not integrated in the United States, that they don't feel comfortable there, that they're dreaming about their, their, uh, their creating a, 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 a state across the, across the Atlantic. During 1865 and into 1866, 
after the conclusion of the American Civil War, there were constant rumors of a planned invasion of Canada by the Fenians as part of their strategy to undermine British rule in Ireland. McGee devoted much of his time and energy during this period to cautioning the Canadian Irish from involving themselves in a revolutionary conspiracy. The tone of many of his utterances was quite violent, bordering on the fanatical at times. In June 1866, after the failed invasion of British North America by the Fenians, McGee dismissed the Fenians as possible. I deny that they represent Ireland to whom Canada has done no wrong. On the contrary, whenever Ireland has appealed to us, we have responded. I will add that a more wanton, immoral, unjustifiable assault has never been made on a peaceful people, and the fate of pirates and freebooters is the only fate that they can, ex that they can expect. So this is what he was saying about the Fenians. And remember, 20 years before that, McGee had taken upon himself the right to rebel in the Citadel. However, even if one accepts the rationale behind McGee's condemnation of the Fenians, it was also around this time that he spoke out against the repeal of the Act of Union between Ireland and Britain, which had been uh, forced on Ireland. Whereas his opposition to the Fenians might be glossed over and excused by his Irish supporters as a conflict over tactics, <coughs> i.e., here was one who rejected rebellion in favour of parliamentary agitation in support of breaking the link between Ireland and Britain. McGee's opposition to repeal was seen and understood in a different light. He was now rejecting what was for many not a, a, a mere tactic, but a fundamental aspiration and a fundamental principle. This sense of confusion, the sense of confusion was increased by McGee's own espousal of the new Canadian nation that he was promoting. He was seen to be advocating independence of sorts for Canada, while dismissing the claims of his homeland for similar treatment. Personally, I don't claim to understand McGee's position on the question of the repeal of the Act of Union between Ireland and Britain. What strikes me, however, is that this was someone who, having lived abroad for nearly 20 years, was fairly ignorant of Ireland. Yes, he still churned out his Irish works and his poetry. He was still interested in the conditions of Irish Canadians. But he was not psychologically nor, nor politically tuned in to native Irish affairs. In reality, whatever about his emotional attachment to Ireland, Darcy McGee knew little of the Ireland of the 1860s, and his opinions on Ireland itself had no more validity than those of one who had lived most of his or her life away from home. However, and this is where we see McGee as the naive politician again, he was forgetting that he was dependent on Irish Canadians who were interested in, uh, in the situation back home, many of whom who were re fairly recently arrived in Canada. By this stage, by, the, by, the, by 1866, 1867, 1867 really, largely if not entirely due on one hand to the force of his anti-Athenian statements, but more importantly I would stress in kind of his anti-repeal at, uh, utterances. McGee had been disowned by many of his Irish supporters in Montreal. He barely retained his parliamentary seat in Montreal, and after Canadian Confederation in July 1867, he was passed over for a cabinet post, which he had ex expected. In part due, he was passed over in part due to the fact that he was no longer perceived by the Canadian government as a credible as a credible spokesman for Irish Canadian Catholics. It was said at the time that he, that he had kind of, uh, uh, hadn't taken a, a, pos a position, but he was expecting it. And I think there seems to be a case that the that people in the government had recognized that McGee didn't really represent Irish, uh, uh, Irish uh, Catholics in Canada. The job went to Kenny of Nova Scotia in his, in his place. Darcy McGee's career was all downhill from this point on. Although Josephine Phelan, for example, claims that he had given up alcohol 
All the reports suggest that he was drinking heavily around this time, that he was suffering from depression and from uh, long bouts of illness. By the way, on the subject of McGee's heavy drinking, the story is told, many of you will know it, of how another heavy drinker, the Prime Minister Sir John A. Macdonald, exclaimed to McGee, Listen here, McGee, the government can't afford two drunkards. You've got to stop. Uh, and to go off on a tangent for a moment, uh, seeing I'm, I'm, I'm on the subject, again, most of you will probably know this one. As you know, many stories are told about McDonald's drinking bouts. The, the, the best known anecdote tells about the time he turned up in an election rally and he was blind drunk. While his opponent was speaking, McDonald's in full view of the audience threw up. When his time to speak came, McDonald started off. Whenever I hear my honourable opponent speak, I always want to vomit. <laughs> anyway, get back to McGee. Anyhow, by early 1868, McGee's political career seemed finished despite his eloquent contribution to Canadian Confederation, his loyalist sentiments and sympathies, and his anti-Fenian activities. Passed over for a cabinet post in the post-Confederation government, his position as leader of the Canadian Irish Catholics was being challenged by others, especially by the Cork-born Timothy Anglin of New Brunswick, who ironically was also an 1848 man who'd been out in the 1848 rising. McGee's assassination in Ottawa on April the 7th, 1868, cut short the life of a gifted and talented man, but it is less clear whether it really cut short his political life. For all intents and purposes, by April 1868, Thomas Darcy McGee was a political outsider once again. What is more definite is that there were major ramifications from his death. First of all, in death, McGee became something of an official Canadian martyr. In fact, the first political martyr in a state where political assassination has been very rare. In his death, the outsider was given an official state funeral in Montreal. And as many of you know, there's a statue to him on Parliament Hill in Ottawa. I don't know, uh, I, perhaps someone here can, uh, can correct me. Is he the only Irish-born person whose statue is in Parliament Hill? I don't know. If McGee was a victim of the troubled times in which he lived, the Irish in Canada were victims of his death, in fact, were victimized by his death. Hundreds of Irish people, people were arrested in Ottawa, Toronto, and Montreal after the assassination. A number were charged in connection with the shooting. One, Patrick James Whelan, a tailor in his late twenties, was sentenced to death, and as I said earlier on, he was hanged. In his study of Whelan's trial, entitled, They Got to Find Me Guilty Yet, T.P. Slattery examines the evidence presented at Whelan's trial. Though born in Edinburgh, in Scotland, and though claiming that his father was English, and in spite of serving in the British Army in India, Whelan clearly viewed himself as Irish. What is less clear is whether he had any involvement with the Fenians. Two of his brothers appear to have had a connection with the Fenians in Ireland. Based on Slattery's material, the most one can say is that Whelan may have been involved in the Fenians on a peripheral level. Even, however, if he was an actor, it is a big jump to declare that he killed Darcy McGee. Slattery demonstrates that the evidence against Whelan was circumstantial at the best. Yes, he was carrying a gun when arrested. A shot had been fired from him recently, but, as Slattery notes, it was common for people in the Ottawa of the time to carry guns, and Whelan's lawyers proved that a maid working in the hotel where Whelan had lived had been injured when the gun was discharged accidentally. Not merely was there only circumstantial evidence against Whelan, but it is clear that he was not given a fair trial. For example, the Canadian Prime Minister, Sir John A. Macdonald, and his wife attended the trial at various occasions, thus conveying by accident or by design the message that uh, far from the legal and court systems being independent, of politicians, that this was a trial in which the Prime Minister personally had a great interest. 
it is unlikely that many jurors viewed his visits as implying that Whedon was, was innocent. Whedon protested his innocence to the very end. There was no death cell or gallows confession. He hinted that he knew who the guilty parties were, but as he told his wife in a rather, yep, in a rather eloquent manner, I'd rather be hanged than be called an informer. Without doubt, there remains enough reasonable doubt about Whelan's conviction to state that he should not have been hanged. But as miscarriages of Guildford, or miscarriages of, of justice from Guildford to Birmingham and Donald Martian can show, uh, police forces and their allies in the legal system and the political world tend to support each other. And when the case has political connections, the hunt is on for a scapegoat. It is almost an irrelevancy if the individuals concerned are guilty or, are guilty or not. Mm. Political expediency replaces justice. In general, uh, the Irish, although there were exceptions amongst the Fenians, who, who by the way claimed that they did not assassinate Darcy McGee, the Irish felt shamed what happened to McGee. And that shame was unscrupulously encouraged by other political groups who sought to take advantage of it and to suggest that the Irish in general were not trustworthy. Indeed, those Irish who had used non-violent methods in their sincere opposition to McGee, who at such had merely used character assassination, were invariably linked in the public mind with those who had physically assassinated Darcy McGee. Overall, the Irish in Canada with suspicion hanging over all of them collectively, were put on the defensive for years afterwards, ironically delaying the political uh, uh, integration that Darcy McGee sought. Moreover, the manner of his death, been overshadowing, overshadowing the other parts of his life, made it difficult for a long time to critically assess Tar Thomas, Thomas Darcy McGee's career. If by 1868 McGee was politically a broken man, after his death, he cast a long shadow over the fortunes and the history of Irish Canadians. A little over four years ago, I was in Ottawa doing research on the activities of your own Catherine Hughes. I had arranged to meet a relative of Hughes, an Ottawa lawyer. We went out for a meal, and afterwards we walked along Spark Street, uh, where, uh, where McGee was assassinated. My companion stopped and pointed out the spot. The lawyer then went on to tell me that it was part of his family's history, that it was a relation of theirs, a Fenian, and not the unfortunate Whelan, who had killed Darcy McGee. The lawyer mentioned the name of the person and some other details. This may be nothing more than family folklore, but it gives some idea of the way in which the legend of Thomas Darcy McGee continues amongst Irish Canadians. And of course, everybody else conspiracies talk about that before on another occasion. Undoubtedly, however, we have now reached the stage where we can look at his career, note the positive things with which he was associated, and weigh up in a relatively detached manner the controversies associated with his life. Beyond that, all we have are the labels. Darcy McGee, poet and patriot. Darcy McGee, traitor and turncoat. Darcy McGee, Irish nationalist turned Canadian nationalist. No matter how we see him, no matter how favourable a label we place on them, none seems, however, to get to the core of this strange and dynamic individual by the name of Thomas Darcy McGee. Though the question arises, and I, I more or less put this in a, as an afternote, um, and also as an afterthought, have we reached the stage where we can be somewhat more dispassionate about him over a century, century and a quarter after his death? In April 1991, I was invited by the Thomas Darcy McGee Society in Carlingford, in County Loud, to give the inaugural lecture to the Society. I spoke then, as I've done tonight, about the man, the contradictions in his personality, the great achievements, the tragic death. I tried to get up beyond all those labels I've just mentioned there. However, in the early hours of the morning, long after the lecture had finished, and we had retired to the local hotel to, to solve the problems of the world, a young man came up to me and said, Let's forget all this academic shilly shallowing. Was he really a police spy? On one level, I find the question depressing. Nevertheless, I couldn't give this guy the definite, the definitive answer he wanted. I don't know. 
Finally, I must add that when I was collecting my thoughts, one of the questions that struck me was whether Darcy McGee would approve of the work that's been done for the Chair of Irish Studies that bears his name. Without doubt, he would appreciate the educational element of our work. However, it's likely that the current multiculturalism, uh, multiculturalism program in Canada, which stresses that one may be both Canadian and Irish, uh, as such, uh, and as such rejects the cultural assimilation, which was the logical outcome of McGee's new Canadian nation, it's likely that this program would not have met with his approval. If that is the case, it is somewhat ironic because much of the original funding for the Darcy McGee chair has come from the self-same multiculturalism program. On another level, with the Canadian Irish safely integrated both socially and politically, it is now that many Irish Canadians are questioning the price that has been paid for that integration in terms of the loss of much of their cultural inheritance and are now attempting to reclaim or to reclaim or salvage it. Darcy McGee might well not like the way in which the prefix Irish Canadian or Canadian Irish that these have come to the fore once again in recent years. However, I would feel uh, that Tom, I do feel that Thomas Darcy McGee would approve of the fact that after years of being associated with poverty, of being a time second-class citizens, and of uh, allegations of disloyalty being leveled against them, that it is now with a strong sense of self-confidence and security that Irish Canadians set about rediscovering their links and ties with their ancestral land. Thank you. Yeah, well, Whelan, of course, was a strong supporter of, uh, of Confederation. He, of course, when he died, was it 1860, 68, was it? Or, yeah, so it was, uh, he, he wasn't around much uh, longer after Darth. Was it 1867 or 1868 that Whelan died? 68, so it was after Thomas Darcy McGee's assassination rather than just before it. Yeah, I think kind of, well, it's clear that, uh, that McGee recognized uh, Will as a, as a, as a, uh, someone who shared many of the, uh, many similar uh, attitudes. Again, the fact that he, he was such a major proponent of, of confederation, and but my under, my understanding is that uh, Whelan was in a minority on this island. But I haven't come across that that, that much stuff. I I I. I, don't, I I, my knowledge about Whelan is, f is fairly limited, to tell you the truth. that he was here when, uh, when the, the various uh, conferences were held. Uh, I, I don't know that he had any connection. I, I haven't come across it in any of the biographies of him uh, being on the island on any other occasion, though he did do an awful lot of touring. That, was, that appeared to be the way in which he earned much of his income, by giving lectures. Well, given lectures, and he travelled much of uh, of, uh, of uh, the eastern part of uh, what is now Canada. <coughs> he may well have been on, on the island. I don't know. Just one little thing, and I get back to your original comment. I tend to show this earlier on. Uh, some of you may have seen this. We'll see how well it comes across. This is the. Uh, you may recognise some of these characters. Right. This is yeah. I, I, 
depending on how one views these things, a rogues gallery or uh, the free statesman, okay, depending on how one views these things, you may recognize the character on our right, okay? You may, some of you may recognize the character on our left, a Charles Hockey, former Irish Taoiseach or Prime Minister. And that is Darcy McGee there in the middle. That the, was at the unveiling of the, the uh, memorial to McGee in Carlingford County Loud in July. 1991. This, uh, this is quite an old um, memorial. Well, let, let me rephrase this. This was passed over to the Irish government I asked a long while ago, as far back as 1950 or something like that there. And it was sitting in storage for a long, long time until one um, quite dynamic figure P.J. O'Hare uh, was his name. He died just before this happened. There was a public in, in, um, in Carlingford. He did a lot of political lobbying to get uh, the, the material removed from storage and to get the memorial erected. So that's now uh, in the center of Carlingford. I don't know how many of you read it. It's a lovely little town. Um, fascinating in its own, own right on the east coast, just off the main uh, Dublin Belfast Road. So uh, that is one of the, perhaps the best way to play it. That's probably the, the, one of the few positive things that have been sort of, uh, that have come out about uh, Thomas Darcy McGee in Ireland in the last few generations. Uh, I would say in general in Ireland, people have hugely, um, contradictory attitudes about him and many gut reactions would be quite negative about Thomas Darcy McGee. They would tend not to focus on the Canadian connection except as regards his reaction towards the Fenians. So they would tend to zone in on what they see as a contradiction from the rebel turned kind of rebel beta of the, of the 1860s. That I think would be the, the major point of one we hear in Ireland about him. Not surprisingly, kind of uh, over here, people would sort of properly recognize his role in Confederation. But uh, question of perception. Yeah, it is, yes. It's, when you go down Spark Street, right, right, uh, Metcalf Street, and the next one, is it O'Connor or Slater? O'Connor, is it? Yeah, so it, it's uh, it's just down from Parliament Hill, uh, and when you come out directly from Parliament Hill, look down, you're looking down Metcalf, and tell me if I'm wrong, uh, and the first turn on your right, when you come down Metcalf, is Spark Street. And as you head down Spark Street, you will be heading west. Uh, on the left-hand side, down towards, uh, towards the junction with O'Connor Street, is where he was assassinated. He, he, he had lodgings there. You said he had two daughters. Yeah. Uh, what he came up there? There was, and Cyril Byrne, with whom I work, had, I remember him talking about this, there was a distant relative uh, of, of Darcy McGee, it could be sort of great, 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 whatever, sorry, but, and Canada, until quite recently, may still be alive. Um, the, the, um, there were, there were other children who died, so just the two surviving daughters. But I, I can't remember where the where the, this relative was. I don't know whether it was someplace out west. I know Cyril, I, um, Cyril Byrne had talked about, uh, I think, having some communication from this person. It was relatively recent. It was in this generation. And you know. Well, Shay, uh, I signed up first. Just a quick one. You well, as I was suggesting there, it, it one is speculating that uh, about the whole thing, of course, because it's uh, um, it's impossible to say. But it was it's not clear by that uh, that he had a that he had a definite constituency to which he could appeal after 1868. He, was, he had a very close run um, 
electoral battle, battle in Montreal just before that, and he was barely uh, re-elected. That could have changed the next time round, but there seems to have been some evidence that he was almost being um, ignored by his former colleagues in government. Uh, they found him that uh, that he wasn't he was rec not recognized as a credible spokesman for Irish Catholics. So I think to some extent one can say yes, this is someone with tremendous ability, tremendous energy. One would think that there would always be a position for someone like that. But at the same time, he seems to have alienated many of what one would have thought had been his natural uh, opponents. And not just because, not, and it wouldn't be just in the, in, uh, the Fingen, uh, um attacks, because many of, I, of his fellow Irish would have, would have shared similar uh, um, sort of attitudes as he had himself towards that. I think a lot of people had problems with his attitude towards Ireland in general. He, he seemed to come awfully pro-British, in a way, kind of. Uh, he seemed to be quite happy to, uh, that Ireland remain as part of the empire. And I think a lot of people had problems with that. Um, so I don't know what would have happened to him. Could have gone back to journalism, uh, back to writing, hard to say. May well have found some kind of a niche for himself in uh, Canadian government. There was some talk, and uh, Slattery mentions this in his biography, of the Canadian government finding a patronage appointment for him. That hadn't turned up by the time that he had died, but there, w there is mention of that. Hard to say, but I think he, he had certainly, he had problems with his own, what was, should have been his own supporters. One of the, the fascinating things, I didn't go into it there, is that if you look at the, um, the trial, uh, and again, Slattery's book, Slattery uh, produced two, book, one on, uh, two books, one is a biography of, of Darcy McGee, and one is, is uh, an account of the trial of Whelan, who was subsequently executed. And uh, one of the things that emerges from, uh, from Slattery's book on the trial is that uh, so many Irish people were involved in the trial i.e. the original judge was Irish born, the counsel for the prosecution was also Irish born, the policeman who, who arrested Whelan was Irish born as well, all this kind of stuff. The one thing that sort of strikes me, and I, just from reading, and, I, and I'm, I'm trying to bring this back to my mind, the, the one place where Irish people didn't turn up was given evidence against Whelan. But uh, as regards on a professional level, a lot of the people involved were Irish. Interestingly enough, that the uh, the lawyer for Whelan was a former Grand Master of the Orange Order in British North America, a guy by the name of Cameron. But uh, but it's interesting that the Irish were so prominent on the on a kind of professional level on uh, the opposite side, which suggests that you one really can't view the the Irish as a uh, in Canada or in any place as a homogenous group. You're talking about different kind of uh, sections, different interests. Why can't you? Uh, uh, maybe you stated this or hinted at it, or implied, maybe I just missed it, but in all these different facets to, to the personality, where do you come down on yourself? Yeah. I. Get around that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I am an unpolog unpolitic Irish nationalist. Um, so I have problems with Darcy McGee's uh, uh, attitude towards um, sort of uh, things like the repeal of the Act of Union between the United Kingdom and Ireland. I think I, I, the closest I suppose kind of I came to sort of stating my own position there as regards trying to make sense of the inconsistencies and the contradictions is when I suggested that this was someone who was so long out of Ireland, they didn't know very much about Ireland. And that, that really, uh, despite his prominent position, despite the, the lyrical poetry about Ireland that he was churning out, didn't know very much about it on a, on a practical level. He was detached from the reality of Ireland, and that was a choice he had made himself, but also the fact 
that he was a that he was an immigrant that he was away so long, and perhaps I was also just in, in my own sort of um, uh, 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 way also suggesting that this is the fate of someone from a place who leaves it and sort of resides somewhere else, i.e. talking about myself. Well, in other words, what do I know really for the state? So I, I suppose uh, if you're asking me kind of uh, where do I come down, as regards all the labels that are attached to Darcy McGee, I don't really feel that they get to the core of the individual. Labels are, are, are just things that are slung on to try and limit, I feel. And uh, again, to reflect people's own political agenda and people's political uh, views of the world. So I, I, I kind of, I'm not particularly happy with any of the any kind of adjectives or any of the nouns that, that were thrown around in the context of Thomas Darcy McGee. However, I would not share many of his attitudes. For example, uh, Thomas Darcy McGee uh, was born next to an Irish-speaking area, Omeev just up until this, uh, well into the century, was Irish speaking. No interest in the language at all. None interest. Again, this sense of someone who was a large, who largely kind of accepted, and he very much kind of, I suppose, uh, uh, one of, of his generation had accepted kind of the, the current political kind of uh, uh, view of the world, which was also shared by someone as, uh, as, as uh, central as Daniel O'Connell, that these things, that the language should be jettisoned, that English was the way forward. So say, even though he grew up next to an Irish-speaking area, no mean, he doesn't appear to be interested in it at all. So in a way, his view of Irish nationalism, to the extent that he was in some way an Irish nationalist, is very much 19th century Irish nationalism, which was quite romantic, which was quite um, not always that politically sophisticated in its own way, which was frequently a product of the national school system established in 1831, which was national in its in its uh, implementation, but was essentially a system of uh, of colonisation. So Darcy McGee went through that system. So in a way, kind of he fits into um, uh, into a mould of, Ir of the Irish nationalists of the first half of the 19th century, and I, I would have problems with that. But again, there's no point always imposing the standards of a later age and something like that. So he's a character that I sort of find fascinating. I don't understand him. There are just all these contradictions. I know, and it's not right, and there's no, no point just throwing labels at him, because he's clearly beyond that. Just to clarify a point, uh, if I got it straight, you suggested that he didn't lose the support of the Irish when he opposed the, uh, the Fenians, the violence of the mm. Fenians. Yeah. Uh, but he lost the support of the Irish in Montreal when he seemed to come out against Irish independence by, let's say, non-violent. Is that correct? Is that Not right? necessarily by non-violent me. He, in fact, stated that uh, he did, that what was clear from his statements by the end of his life was that he viewed the political uh, arrangement between Ireland and Britain as a satisfactory arrangement. So he did not see that there was any need for an independent Irish state. In other words, he accepted the link with the monarchy. You're suggesting that the Irish... I would say that was a, a, a factor. I would, I would consider that what you have is there are a number of factors. Yes, there would have been those whose, whose attitude would have been who would have been pro fenian that probably was a minority. But a greater kind of core would have been the ones, for example, in the St. Patrick's Society in Montreal. They expelled them, the, most, the, the, the organization of the Irish, the major organization of the Irish in Montreal. They had expelled them as a member a few years before that because they had sort of felt that he was coming out with statements that were largely anti-Irish. Thank you. 
Yeah, I think at the same time one can say that uh, while, while that, that may be the case, at the same time Thomas Darcy McGee when he got onto something almost became obsessed with it as well. There, like this sense kind of, uh, of Canadian Confederation, yeah he became obsessed with that. This sense of making sure that the Irish didn't get involved and Canada didn't get involved with the Fenians, that becomes a form of obsession. Uh, so I think kind of there, there's a sense, kind of yes, that this is someone who was uh, who was scholarly, who was uh, who in a way only came to politics not as indirectly, even though he'd always been a political creature, but at the same time, who seems to have been quite good. For example, standing up and making a speech, doing the things that kind of, especially in years gone by, going up standing up and uh, and platforms and and uh, getting across his point. He seems to have been quite good on that level. So I don't know whether... Again, I suppose I, I, I'm reluctant to sort of sit, to set up extremes that a politician has to be kind of dense and uh, non-intellectual and things like that there, or even that an academic has to be intellectual, God bless us. But uh, I, I'm reluctant to kind of set up these things because my experience, limited enough as it is, shows it's not necessarily the case. That, uh, so I, I don't know, kind of, uh, uh, I, I would not kind of, I don't think one act precludes the other. Well, think of all the successful intellectuals who have been successful politicians who have had a political career. Yeah. Well, I mean, okay, are you, are you going to start off the list there, are you? <laughs> or, or have you started and finished the list? <laughs> Well, I, the first thing is that so much of it was written uh, at, uh, clearly at speed when he was kind of doing umpteen other things. Uh, a lot of it is kind of fairly romantic, perhaps uh, one might sort of suggest model and stuff, but there actually is some stuff there that's quite good. But like, personally, I, I have I have a problem with much kind of, uh, of the poet, 19th century English poetry in general. Uh, it's not exactly sort of... Uh, come across to me as the mo most inspiring period because so much of the stuff is uh, is influenced by the whole Victorian age and uh, and the whole kind of question of empire and things like this. Um, so I would say that uh, probably based on the poetry I would re I would uh, I have read uh, there probably is a case for a slim edition of uh, the the best of Darcy McGee. <laughs> I don't know if anybody here is working on a big edition of it. I think it's something that you should undertake. Yeah, well, I, 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 I suggest that to Cyril Burton before that, that we actually should be publishing a, a new uh, a, a collection of Thomas Darcy McGee's material between his speeches and his, um, and his poetry, uh, because so much of the material, in fact, is out of print now. And actually, quite a lot of it is collector's uh, um, material, but this day it's quite difficult to come across. We at St Mary's have a fair amount of it, but there are, there are volumes that I know Cyril Byrne, our coordinator, has been keeping an eye out for. Uh, by the way, this guy here, uh, Ryan Rooney, I don't know if you noticed, uh, in any of his speeches, he used to quote Thomas Darcy McGuigan quite often. Quite a lot. What's that, Mike? <laughs> but he actually, uh, I, I don't know if any other kind of contemporary politician has uh, has tapped into the, the, the Thomas Darcy McGee material, but certainly uh, Brian Mulroney had. Any other questions? Yeah, now I have just one more. Uh, and then we'll turn to a vote. Uh, just wondering what, if any influence, uh, uh, this effect. How did the Irish community in Canada um, uh, view the Federation? Were they mostly for or mostly against? And what part, if any, did Darcy McGee play in that? Uh, I, 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 I
Well, I think kind of what I was suggesting earlier on, that uh, one can view the Irish as a homogenous group. Um, for example, um, Archbishop Connolly of Halifax was quite strongly uh, in favour of it. Most of the, uh, the, uh, of, the, uh, of the Irish in New Brunswick were against it. So there's kind of a patchful thing influenced by kind of local leaders and other factors. So I think kind of that, and frequently influenced by, say, by the local, with the local scene on the ground, in some place like New Brunswick, that uh, uh, they, 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 ha they, of course, would have had uh, their own problems there, in some place like St. John. And again, the major figure there in St. John was Timothy Anglin, this 1848 man, who was a, a political opponent of, uh, of Darcy McGee, despite his, uh, his connections with him in the back in Ireland in 1848. Um, so, what role Thomas Darcy McGee played in the whole thing? Clearly, uh, McGee was in contact regularly with, we were talking about Whelan and, and here in PEI earlier on, he was in contact regularly with people like uh, Connolly, the Archbishop in, uh, in Halifax, trying to build up support. So, again, but it was. Of course, the history of Confederation in Canada was not of a great event which suddenly took place where, where everybody came in, as you know yourself, with, with a PEI connection and things like that there. So it very much reflected kind of uh, local, the local situation. Uh, overall, I would say that um, uh, probably the majority of, of Irish Catholics would not have been in favour of it, I, I would think things like the, the Irish Catholic numbers in some place like, uh, like New Brunswick at that stage. Last call for questions? I suppose I would have started off with the uh, with the Irish nationalist view of Darcy McGee as someone who sold out. Uh, I start, and uh, as I read more, I would uh, I'll say that the situation is much more complicated and complex than that. And as I was saying that earlier on, that one shouldn't impose. Contemporary standards on on, uh, on on him and on his times, which were quite different than uh, than the present situation and the present understanding of things. So I, I would acknowledge by this stage that McGee is a much more um, there are many more dimensions to him than I would uh, I previously recognised. And again, getting one of the other point I was making earlier on, I would now recognise there's no point trying to give a, a one label or two labels to him. We're dealing with much more um, multi sort of faceted character than than, than than mere labels can convey. Yeah, yeah. I think so, and I think kind of he is, he, he was both a, a leader of his times, but also a victim. I don't like using that word because it's, it's so, it's so uh, abused these days, but that uh, he was a victim of his, uh, of, of his times and of the politics of his times. And um, I, I sort of mentioned there that the political assassination really hasn't been a an awfully um, uh, central part of the Canadian experience. I suppose if you want to sort of give, no, the, the, I, I would say that you can sort of see three examples and one people can argue with and uh, uh, the, the other one of course, apart from McGee, is uh, the 1971 uh, with the FLQ. Uh, the third one, I say this is where people might argue, is uh, uh, Louis Riel, which was kind of, uh, uh, sort of uh, judicial and political kind of uh, uh, assassination, um, but.
but um, uh, it's apart from that, like that really hasn't kind of it hasn't been a central part either from the world. Uh, it hasn't been a central part of of the Canadian experience, unlike the world which McGee left in Ireland, where it has been and uh, for a long time a political uh, a fact of life, and the world which he experienced in the United States, where it is not unknown. So I suppose in, in that way it's slightly ironic that uh, that uh, he. Um, uh, that he's one of a, a very small number uh, in this part of the world. Um, of the people, uh, the radicals that he uh, was friends with during the time of the Ireland, how many of them actually did stick to the cause, or how many of them did stay the peace of the Yeah, and many of them left Ireland. Uh, and became celebrated individuals abroad. For example, Gavin Duffy down in Australia became a prominent figure there. Uh, Thomas Marr became what was it, a brigadier in the Union Army in the United States and was drowned in Missouri fairly soon after the um, uh, after the um, the American Civil War. Uh, who else? Uh, I suppose the 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 ones who. Uh, the other ones would be, say, uh, Terence Bellew McManus, who died in poverty in uh, it was San Francisco, I think it was in 1861, and who nine months later, after lots of, uh, of uh, trials and tribulations, was finally buried in Ireland, despite the opposition of the Catholic, clergy, Catholic Archbishop of Dublin. Um, the other one, I suppose, is, uh, uh, is John Mitchell, who is in many ways just as an... an, an uh, enigmatic and, and uh, contradictory figure as Thomas Darcy McGee. Um, 